recording, so anything you say is going to be posted on YouTube, so don't say anything stupid. Um, Yo, Ali. The second part of this is, so we just spent the last time getting, everybody got burp installed, so which is what we did last week, and then everybody got Docker installed so that we can play with a vulnerable image later. So we left off uh, about HTML forums. So you'll see as you play with um, the, when you look at form, so a form is what puts that input box on your screen. So we looked at HTML, so the form is specifically the way that, uh, one way that input can be specified. Um, so, and I think last time we looked in our burp proxy, we could see a form. So here, like this form, the search the docs form, uh, let's see, if I right click on this and I say view page source, this may work, it may not work, I have no idea. Uh, search the docs. So I can see that this is a form. It has a class, which is about cascading style sheets, we can ignore it. It has an ID and it has an action. So the action is important because this is a relative URI that specifies where should this request go when we submit this form. Can you yes. make it bigger? Yes. Thank you. Mm, maybe not. <laughs> I just made the Docker page huge. Oh, wait, wait, can I zoom? I'm zooming, nothing's happening. It probably has its own like, control panel. Yeah, but I don't know how. Yeah, see, it's only affecting that. Uh, sorry, yeah, I can't. You have to trust me. <laughs> so it has this action, oh man, that's not even good quality. Uh, action <laughs> equals slash, so this is the action attribute of the form tag. So the action attribute specifies where the request should go. So this means uh, when they post or when they submit this form, the browser should make a request to the host, which is docs.docker.com slash search. Uh, and another slash actually at the end. Uh, let's see, the other thing in here, there's no method specified, so what's the default method? Yep. Get, yeah, so it's gonna be a get request. So the, uh, Method attribute specifies what kind of HTTP request the browser should make, if it's either a get or a post. The data will be encoded in different ways depending. So for an input, we have an input field here. There are different types of input fields. So this is an attribute. I had no idea there was a search value here. I've only ever seen type equals uh, text. Yeah, that's the standard one. This must be like an HTML5 thing. But what the browser does, so when you, let's see, there is a button that's of type submit, so this is how it creates the submit button, which is here, it's this little icon, I think, is what they have here. Um, what happens is the browser looks for all these sub-children of the form that are inputs or text areas or check boxes or some other things, uh, any kind of input parameters, you can look at the specification to find out. And it takes their name, right? So here the name is Q. It puts whatever the value was passed in there as a URL parameter. So if it's a get request, it'll put it as part of the URL parameter. So it will be, so if I put in foo here, the request that my browser should generate, assuming there's not any JavaScript nonsense going on, will be a an HTTP request to docs.docker.com slash search slash uh, question mark Q equals foo. Oh. So this is exactly what it searched for here, up at the top. And so. So Q is for like what queries? It doesn't matter to us. So they yeah, that's why it's okay. It could be Q, it could be foobar, it could be query. Is it a standard or they made it up? They made it up. Okay. So every web application basically defines their own interface of how they want to pass parameters. Um, now, if this was a post request, so get puts it in the query parameters. If it's a post request, it's sent as the body of the HTTP request. So most of the HTTP requests we saw were, um, were had no body. So normally if you're just doing a get request, you would never send a body in the HTTP request, but 
if you're sending a post and you're trying to send data, that data will be encoded in the body. Okay, I think that's the main takeaways from here. Um, one tricky thing about URL encoding of forms is that plus is translated to, spaces are translated to plus instead of percent 20. It's URL encoding except for this. You can also use percent 20, it's very weird. So that's how the data is sent. So it's basically like URL parameters, except for this little tweak. Um, cool. So yeah, we can see this is a form. So this one I can't make bigger. Or I can't. Uh, anybody have a really good memory and know exactly where we were? It was like 50 something. Yep. Okay. So this is a form, a post form. So this is to example.com slash grade slash submit. So we have, now we have actually four input fields. So there should be four parameters, a student parameter, a class parameter, a grade parameter, and a submit parameter. The value here is what will be inside that text field by default, if there is one. So it will be bar. And when it submits, if you didn't change anything, it will be bar. So if I were to change this to change for me as a student, CSE 590, which is a class I taught, and a grade of A+, plus, if I click Submit Query, it is going to make a, the browser will make a post request to example.com slash grade slash submit. And so here we can see, unlike other HTTP requests, we have a content length, and the content type says that it's this X www form URL encoded. And so it will URL encode our data that we send. So it'll set student equals to the value I typed in, and class equals CSE space 591, and grade equals A plus, and submit equals submit query. So this is how the server can then tell what application, what data was sent. Okay. So we did that, we did that. Okay, next things that are important. Um, so what we looked at so far are the fundamentals of how the web works. Right? So these are incredibly important because without these, you don't really understand any of the other vulnerabilities. Um, the web used to be just simple HTML pages, so there's nothing dynamic. Like even when you think about Yahoo, the way Yahoo, anybody know what Yahoo was originally, except for Eric? <laughs> Netscape? Netscape? <laughs> no. Oh, uh, Geos? Geos No. What was like the original functionality of Yahoo? Um, Ask. A site directory? Like yes. Category. It was just a directory. It was just a site directory of categories of types of websites with links to other websites. Wow. It wasn't even a search engine. It wasn't even anything. So they did they hard code everything? Kind of. If I'm sure. Yeah. If it, it wasn't probably, search engine, it was it must have been hard code. At the start, it's wow. just all static. Um, and you could if you use the Wayback Machine, which is has anybody ever played with that? you can look at versions of websites that were as they looked way back then, so it's really cool. Anyways, so over time people realized, man, static web pages are cool and useful, but it would be really useful if we could actually have a full-fledged application that lived on the server that we could interact with over HTTP and use HTML for the user interface. Uh, so that was kind of a big shift, because if you think back in the day, you either used an application that you downloaded to your computer or you maybe use some application that ran on the server, but it would use some custom protocol, so you'd have a viewing software to be able to view it. Um, and so web applications were a way of running full-fledged applications on a server. Um, and the web was really structured this way. So this is why we have all these query parameters, we have post parameters, we have ways to actually interact with the website. Um, and get and post kind of have this, so get means that just give me the resource. So the spec says, even though this is not, you know, it doesn't have to be this way, but get should not have any other action except for retrieving something. So there should be no side effects. Like making a get request should be perfectly safe all the time. It's safe and item potent. So what's item potent? Besides a confusing word. OS, people take an OS class. I didn't see that word in there. Yeah, what? You guys teaching in OS. What do you learn about threading? What about 
Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know this. Wait, yeah, what did you so, call this? I can guess, like, the state before the get should be exactly the same as the state after the get. Yes. Server. In essence, it means um, when you make a get, you can make more than one request, and it does not affect the results at all of what you get, or doesn't change the state of the application. So making one request is the same thing as making 100 requests. But yeah, it just means it doesn't change anything. Post is actually used for changing data. This is what the spec says, I'm not going to go into it. Um, so this is the core concept behind a web application, and this is why I often use the, I think of it differently, and it's also because I'm ac an academic and I like to label things correctly. A website is something that's completely static that you just visit. Like me, like mm -hmm. if you go to my homepage, that's just a website. Like it's literally, just generated HTML code that doesn't do anything special, it just displays stuff, right? A web application is dynamically generating HTML responses, HTML in response to your HTTP requests. So that's fundamentally to me what a web application is. Um, and one of the key problems that we looked at so far is that each request, HTTP request is distinct, right? When we looked at get slash, you know, from host google.com, we're asking Google to give us the homepage of slash, right? So by default, um, the web, so the server has the client IP address and the user agent, right? That's what we send in, the, in our request. Um, but the problem is how do you link different requests, right? If you want to build an actual application, you need to know hey, is this person requesting a page from me the same person I saw a month ago, or is it a brand new person? Right? And the way HTTP itself is, there's no, that information does not exist at all in the request. There's nothing that says, hey, remember me, I'm the person from last time. And so the community had to actually build this kind of on top of HTTP. So it's really about maintaining state. So fundamentally, HTTP is stateless. You just make a request and you get a response. You make a request, you get a response. And every time you make a request, the server says, hey, brand new person. Great, here's your response. So, but we want to maintain state and link our request together. And the goal is to create a session so that we are actually interacting with the same user over time. Okay. Well, we're gonna get there, yeah. So, there's three ways that this is done. Uh, we'll go, we're not gonna go into the other ones, we're gonna go mainly into the main one where this actually happens. Um, oh, good, we did not do that. Okay, so cookies. Cookies are basically state information. The cookies, uh, if you've ever been told to clear your cookies or clear your browser's cookies, this is exactly what they're talking about. So cookies are a way that the web server can ask the web client, hey, store this bit of information for me, and next time you talk to me, send it back to me. That way I know that you're actually the same user that I've been talking to. Um, and either the <coughs> server or the user agent can terminate the session. So if you delete your cookies and make a new request to the web server, it thinks you're a brand new person. The server can decide to terminate your session as well. Has anybody been logged out of their like bank account if they've left it open? Right? That's the same type of thing. Um, okay, there's RFCs that define cookies. Um, Cookies are name value pairs separated by equal sign. So again, there's a little bit of consistency in the web, just like URL parameters. Uh, if a server wants to set cookies, it sends the set cookies header to tell the client, hey, please set these cookies. Uh, so it can say set cookies user equals foo or whatever it wants. Then on every subsequent request, the user agent or your browser should send the cookie back with a cookie header that says, hey, these are the cookies. So when it makes a request, it would say cookie user equals foo. Uh, you can ask for multiple set cookies, so you can set as many cookies as you want. I think browsers do have limits probably on the total number and the size of the data you can store into a cookie, but that probably varies between browsers. Um, there are also, the other thing is, there's attributes that the browser can set on a cookie, right? So, because the key question is, okay, a server sent me this cookie, when do I send it back? Do I send it back on the entire domain? Or do I restrict it based on the path? So the path allows the server to restrict a cookie to only a specific uh, URL. 
domain. So this would be like some things, uh, I'm trying to think of a good example. Is it, what, what allows you to create your own like subdomains on their sites? Like uh, free webs, is that free, what we're talking about? Yeah, anything that, or Slack, allows you to, Slack so list. like a subdomain. Like, Slack list. Slack, yes, Slack's a good one. Oh, uh, right. ASU.edu? Yes, well, maybe, Slack's a better one. Okay. Uh, so for Slack, right, depending on which Slack channel you're on, like ours is pwndevils.slack.com. There's also other Slacks, like UCSB, I think has like seclab.slack.com, right? And so the idea is you don't want, you want those cookies to only be restricted to that subdomain. So they will restrict it and say, hey, don't send these cookies to like only send these cookies to the Pwn Devil Slack. Um, the server can say how long this cookie should be valid for. It can say other security things, which we'll talk about later, of HTTP only that says this cookie should only be sent over HTTP and should not be accessed through JavaScript. We haven't got to JavaScript yet. Secure says this cookie should only be sent over HTTPS connections. So this is secure connection. So, uh, so this was a curl request I made a long time ago. These are the headers that Google.com sent back. Just making a brand new curl to Google.com. You can do this and try this, it's kind of cool. Um, you can see that it's sending this preference equals, and this is everything here from the end, from here to the semicolon is the cookie. Again, it's just an opaque blob to the client, this value that's being set. You know, we as humans can look at this and see, yeah, they're doing some weird splitting on colons here. Um, I don't know what this FF, ID, LM, TM, you know, you'd have to kind of look at it to see what it is. And they also ask for two different cookies, uh, one HTTP only and the other one that's not. Uh, so yeah, so this is the value of the preference PREF cookie. I hope there's nothing important in here, but whatever. Um, the expires, oh no, it just expired last month, that's funny. Uh, the path, this is why you should net, if you ever make slides, don't ever put times and dates or the current <laughs> class in them. That's what I found by experience. Um, yeah, so this one specifically says to send it to all subdomains of google.com. So this is why anywhere you go to in google.com, these cookies will be sent and Google knows how to link you. Um, this one is HTTP only. So an interesting thing, so the idea, well, okay. So, uh, uh, okay, I don't want to go into all this. Okay, so cookies are used for, okay, the other thing we need to talk about, oh man, I did it again, sorry. It was in the 50s, it's probably 60 something. That was 74, 74, look at us. Okay, the other thing we need to think about, so we've been talking so far about clients and web servers. Right, but we need to add another layer there. We need the actual web application code. So the client makes an HTTP request to the web server. The web server, like Apache or Nginx, its entire job is talking HTTP. All it does is accept incoming HTTP requests. It doesn't actually do any complex processing. There's some web application code behind that that the web server passes the request back, gets a response, the web application has to generate an HTML page that will then get passed to the web server, which will then send it back as an HTTP response. Exactly how this mechanism happens depends on the web server. Rails is different from Python, which is different than PHP. So there's all different kinds of technologies. I suggest you look at this to get familiar with all different type of ways to make web applications. But now we are going to get into JavaScript, don't care. Where is the MySQL? Okay, cool. So, um, I suggest if you're not familiar with PHP, you look over the slides in PHP, you get familiar with PHP. Um, it is the absolute most popular language on the web, and there's a lot of really crappy PHP code. Um, and so really like learning, P PHP is 
the biggest language on the web. So it um, behooves you to learn that. And so the classic, so a LAMP stack is Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. This is kind of the bog standard web application. Um, and this is nice because you can actually swap out each component. So we'll talk about MySQL really quickly, and then we'll get into vulnerabilities. So MySQL is currently the second most used open source relational database. Anybody know what the first is? Postgres? Nope. Oracle? They, they wish. Oracle? SQL? Nope. SQLite? SQLite. Why SQLite? iPhone, Android. Yeah, all mobile devices. Like Android to iPhones, uh, everything. Uh, even, I think, Mac OS, I think, is using SQLite internally. Uh, well, I know Firefox. Browsers, browsers, use, it. browsers use it, Firefox. too. Firefox uses it. Yeah, so tons. I mean, SQLite is everywhere. Uh, but on the web, MySQL is definitely the most popular. Uh, it was an open source project that was purchased by Sun, which is now owned by Oracle for a billion dollars, which is pretty cool. Um, so the other thing, so this is what we studied so far. We studied HTTP. We studied URLs. We studied uh, HTML. We looked at forms and how those work. So that's already three essentially languages or specifications that are incredibly important. Throw on top of that PHP, because you should be able to read PHP code. And then SQL, the structured query language, which is used by most web applications to fetch things from a database. That's like five technologies that you need to be proficient in and understand in order to do web security. And this is part of the reason why web security is difficult, because there's a lot of different technologies in play. And this is just the basics. Right? Getting on top of that, you have much more complicated stuff. Um, so SQL is a, maybe, how many know have done SQL? Oh, most of you. OK, this should be quick. Uh, special language to interact with the database, different commands, select, give me things, update, change things, insert, add new things, uh, delete, delete things um, at a very high level. Uh, there are. Even though it, SQL itself is a well-defined language, there is differences in the syntax and implementation among the different database engines. So that's something when you're testing a website and you have no idea what the back application is written in, that is, um, can be a problem. So a SQL query looks something like this. Select star, so select, so SQL is a table-oriented database. So you have a database which has multiple tables. Each table has a different number of columns. So for instance, this query is trying to get all the columns from the users table where the username column equals Adam. Okay. Or we can try to select all columns from the book table where price is greater than 100.00, order by title. So this will order the results based on the titles of the book. I think alphabetic by default and ascending order first, and you can flip it around with a descending here too. You can do complicated nestings of queries. You can have, um, so this is selecting the ISBN number column, the title column, the price column from the book table. Where the price column is less than, select the average price from book. So average is a function, so it's going to average all of the prices. So this is getting all of the books that are less than the average price from the database. So it's doing subqueries. This is an insert, so insert into the example table where Column one of field one, column two, field two, column three, field three, is test n and null. Update, update table example, set column field one equal to updated value, where field two is equal, where column of field two is n. Uh, you have unions, which are crazy, which I'm not really gonna get into right now. Um, so this is a snippet from how to use PHP to connect to a MySQL database? Is there anything interesting here? Uh, no. OK. Cool. So now I switch over to my other slides. Sorry, this is not in the Dropbox yet, because I'm stealing this from something else. Uh, OK, we're definitely talk about that. What about avoiding jail? That seems important. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we've already done that, right? OK, well, this will be easy then. OK, we've, it's been a long time. If we have done this. Don't do anything illegal. Uh, don't hack into a site that you do not own or have permission. This is actually very important as part of this group. Um, probably don't emphasize this enough, but 
we're emphasizing it now, so that's good. So, and also, don't, this means don't even attempt to find vulnerabilities in a site that you don't own or have permission. So this is like if you were walking around the street, try walking up to every house you saw and trying to jiggle the doorknob <laughs> to see who didn't lock their house. Uh, you know, even if you're not gonna open the door, it's not a nice thing to do, it's not an ethical thing to do, and it can get you in trouble. You're still trespassing. Um, in that case, yes, you may still be trespassing. But doesn't it happen all the time and it helps them out too? Uh, People disclose the vulnerabilities. But you don't get to choose whether, like, that you, because you are actively testing against a real life service, so you can't guarantee that your testing's not going to affect their service in any way. So if you end up, what if you end up taking down their service, crashing it, it cost them millions of dollars, right? And all you were doing was trying to help them out, right? But then it's their fault for not. <laughs> That's your fault. You they deliberately caused that, caused that action. That's like saying you left your car unlocked and it's yeah. your fault that it got stolen. Yeah, so that, because you did not have permission to do that. If you have permission, you can do whatever you want. So I'm going to give you resources in this group of websites to hack and how to actually play with it. The key is it's got to be running on your system. So that's what we'll do with today. It's if it's you can take any open source project, take WordPress, take anything, install it on your machine, and you can go to town and do whatever you want to it. Uh, service servers that you own and you have set up, you can do whatever you want to it, right? It's your server. It's just like I can try to hack into my laptop as much as I want. Uh, it's unethical for me to try to hack into Will's laptop unless he gives me permission, which I do not. Right? Which he does not. <laughs> so good. Uh, the third one is. So not to sound super negative, a lot of websites actually have bug bounty programs, including big ones like Facebook. Facebook. I'm trying to think of ones that I absolutely know have it. Uh, Facebook, Google, uh, I think GitHub may. If you just Google bug bounty websites, there's tons of websites out there that have bug bounty programs. And what how these work is they say, hey, we give you the right, or the, we give you permission to try to find vulnerabilities in our site, and depending on the site, there may be some guidelines. So for Facebook, they specifically give you a test section of their website where you can create as many fake accounts as you want, and they say go to town, do anything on this site that you want, but don't affect the real Facebook site, um, unless you absolutely have to do that to show your vulnerability. So then when you find the vulnerability, then you report it to them, and oftentimes they'll give you money for finding it. So yeah, uh, really cool stuff. Oh, Amazon has one too, I believe. Yeah. Um, so there's lots of opportunities to practice. The things we talk about today, please do not go and just try searching for SQL injection vulnerabilities on the web. You will find one eventually, but you still should not do that. You should practice on your own things. Okay. Can we talk about CNA? Okay. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about this. Okay, so now we need to talk about, um, oh, maybe this is a good example. Okay. So we're going to look at finding vulnerabilities in web applications from the outside. So we don't know the source code of the application, right? So this is simulating a real attacker, right? The attacker doesn't have inside knowledge of the organization, but is still trying to find vulnerabilities in the application. So our goal is to try to make, some, make the application, the web application, do something that it's not supposed to do, right? And this is incredibly broad, right? So we're going to focus on two things today, SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Well, maybe just SQL injection, but, um, but web application vulnerabilities could be all kinds of things, right? So like on Facebook, there is a famous vulnerability where anybody could write on anybody's wall, right, without being friends with them, which is a clear vulnerability and a bug, but it's not necessarily something that you would think of classic SQL injection or cross-site scripting. So there's all kinds of permission issues that you have to be aware of. Um, but in order to actually find vulnerabilities, you actually need to understand the application. Because if you don't know what the application does, then you won't know if what you found is actually a vulnerability or not. And you always have to be thinking about when you're testing a website, what's the intended functionality, what's the intended behavior, 
and trying to figure out what does the application use as input, so where is my input used in the application, and what does the application produce as output. For example, what if I told you that you found on a website that anybody not logged into the website could edit the content of a page on that site? Is that a serious vulnerability? Yeah. No. No. Wikipedia does that. Yeah. The answer is it depends, right? It sounds really bad. If it's CNN.com and I can just sitting here edit the homepage of CNN.com, that sounds like a very serious vulnerability. But that is the entire point of Wikipedia is that random arbitrary people can edit contents on a page. Right? And so this shows that understanding what the web application is supposed to do is critical to finding these vulnerabilities. Okay. <laughs> How do we rob a bank? Oh. I already talked about this in class. Somebody who's not in my class. Guess you've I'm watched not. movies. Hopefully nobody here has actually robbed a bank. <laughs> yeah. so you've watched movies about bank robberies. <laughs> you walk in, slip the teller a note. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is you want to get out. caught, Will. So then no, you, you know, they like 60% of uh, bank robbers don't get caught because they just slip them the note and they get out. Uh, they only grab okay. like several thousand real, dollars. Like, Ocean's Eleven didn't just slip anybody a note. <laughs> Crawl through the yeah. vents. What's the first step? Case it. Case it. So you need to... You perform reconnaissance, right? You need to gather as much information as possible about the bank. You want to know what guards are working there. What's their shift schedule like? When do they go on smoke breaks? When do they take lunch breaks? When do they switch shifts? What happens when they switch shifts? Switch shifts. Who works? Who's the manager of the bank? Who are his or her wife, husband, or kids? Right? The more information you have about the bank, maybe you go to City Hall and try to get the plans for the bank. Right? The more information you have, the better your heist is going to get. And this is always the first step. They do, you know, they like go to the cafe across the street and like wear hats while they pretend to talk but are really checking out the bank. This is the first step. Well, zero, step zero is assemble your team. Uh, that's not fun. Uh, yeah. Then you build some elaborate plan and everything goes wrong and maybe you profit, maybe not. But the point is, the first one is reconnaissance, and you should take this mindset to testing web applications. Right? You first need to use it to figure out as much as you can. Okay. Same thing you're doing here. You need to ask yourself, how does this work? Are there user accounts? Do the user accounts have different privileges? Right? How are privileges actually enforced? Are they enforced? Right? That would be a good finding. Uh, what does the layout of the web application look like in terms of URLs? What do the URLs of the web application look like? Uh, what URLs should only be accessible to a certain privilege? What are admin URLs versus logged in URLs versus logged out URLs? And then try testing the opposites. Right? What is all the ways I can get input into this web application? Right? So we saw it's forms, but it's also the headers that you send to the web application. The anything that you post, anything that you send in a GET request, anything in the path, all things are ways that your input can get to the web application. What is the output of this web application? And the key thing you're always thinking about is how is the web application likely written? So this is, uh, this is why being a web developer actually helps you out a lot in pen testing web applications. Because uh, I do this a lot, is I'm thinking about, okay, if I was really lazy, which developers are all the time, what would I have forgotten about? What are the corner cases they likely didn't think about? Right? And then I'll test those things. Um, then you always want to think like a scientist. So you want to develop a what I call a vulnerability hypothesis. Right? So you want to say, ha, huh, I think there could be a SQL ejection vulnerability on this parameter. That's a hypothesis, right? You think that there could be. Then you need to actually test that hypothesis. So you need to give input to the web application, and you need to know before you make that input, if it does X, then I know it's vulnerable. If it does Y, or if it does X, then I know my hypothesis is true. If it does Y, I know my hypothesis is false. Right? If you can't distinguish, then you made a terrible experiment. Right? The truth could be either true and false. Then you actually develop an exploit to exploit that vulnerability to do cool stuff when you found a real vulnerability. Then you profit. Okay, we talked about this, all the different ways we can get input into the web application. Uh, Wacko Pico, oh, I don't have a reset. Uh, okay, so 
you should be able to, if everything went well, you should be able to do docker pull Adam Dupay slash Wago Pico. So try that. So this is, I created a Docker image that has this vulnerable, intentionally vulnerable web application running or inside of the container. And so if you pull it, it won't actually run anything. It's just getting all the files from Docker Hub onto your machine. I realize it's not actually big enough. Okay, what's next going on? We're flooding the internet now. It's not that big. It's fine. ASU's got a big fight. Have we got it? Much hair. When I downloaded Docker, it reinstalled VirtualBox and uh, changed all the IDs of my machines, so I can't use my machines. So now I have to move all my machines, which is 120 gigs. Delete VirtualBox, reinstall VirtualBox, then I upload. I a lot of complaining, really. Uh, 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 he, he. Is it working? Um, um, downloading or downloading? What do I do? Let's go knock. Let's go. 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 I still have 48 gigs to go. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so you need to move Docker. Yeah. Oh, so I don't know. So what? I guess I'll look fine. I need to look fine. Cool. Good. I made it. Okay. Hey, what's the difference uh, between yeah. Docker and Docker? Uh, and just, uh, oh, you still Docker? Yeah. I don't know what Docker is. Go Google it. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, I had to uninstall it. <laughs> Adam just installed like a bunch of rootkits and rats and just yeah. not where. It's really cool how it's doing that. Yeah. It's regenerating yeah. that entire thing of text. Yeah. Did it do all that yeah. if you're in a bunch of you? It's cool. Although actually, it's cool. Although actually, it's cool. Although actually, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's there's a newer image I can download? I haven't downloaded the newest one. It makes no sense. Uh, 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 so what do I do now? You didn't, I don't think you downloaded it. Now you can get that. He said it the first time. I was like, it was the domain where you can download it. You can do the one with the latency. Or don't. Oh, you can't. You don't have a distribution. You're wrong. Images of the studio. Yeah, it's probably exists between keyboard and chair. Yeah. Uh, Mm. It's probably spinning out Stop DB and uh, <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not an ID 10 T error. Uh, well, you are. Jesse, uh, so Jesse. I bet you have to go on this. Yes, kind of. Yes. I don't know, dude. What do you want me to say? ID 10 yes. T. Type them in your. Oh, I did it. Uh, no, but actually, it's kind of. But I am wearing it. I only know I'm wearing it. I didn't tell you. So what? Why this is showing? One second, I need. He doesn't have the right. Oh, it's working. Yeah. It's long. It's appropriate. Uh, it's like Hi, Jesse. Breathing. Wait, this is Cali, right? I got, I'm just yeah. trying to test my test. Yeah. 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 When I leave the here, I'll put yeah. it on. To, uh, <laughs> I got 20 <laughs> gigs <laughs> remaining. I'm almost there. Yeah. 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 Perfect number of gigs. Perfect. 20. Yeah, but the thing is, your LSP yeah. release is not. Uh, so how's that? Yeah. No, to go to your page and get but a right, 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 right. Docker has a Docker yeah, hub where people can push their own okay. like, See, Docker packages. So that's why it's so I'm not used to getting back to the Docker. It's just like Git, essentially. Yes. Give me a 9.0. What's the code? I'm just finding that interesting. No, 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 that's what it should be. Yeah, it's. I don't know how they're going to make money. Where did it put it? When you downloaded it, just um, magically magic you just Docker. Set up really somewhere. Uh, okay, so Docker, uh, quick overview for those that don't know. So Docker, so everybody know virtualization, virtual machines, yeah. right? You're all running virtual machines, right? So what's happening there? How does that work? The software is pretending to be another machine. Yeah. So your the virtual box, either virtual box VMware, is pretending to be a CPU that another thing is running on top of it, right? Another operating system is running on top of it. 
So you have this very hard separation between the virtualized OS, which thinks it has full control of the hardware, and the actual host OS where it's running on. Um, so that's one end of the spectrum. You get really good separation there, so they're very you know, hardly separated. Uh, the downside is it's very slow because you have to emulate this CPU, right? Even though there's other techniques to speed it up. Um, so Docker is kind of in a weird middle ground. So Docker uses LXC, which is this Linux container. Mm, I don't know if it's what the right word is, technology or module. What that does is allows you to run a process on Linux in its own view of its own file system. So it can't see any of the other files in the file system. And it you can also restrict the networking capabilities of what ports it can access or ports it can listen on, all this kind of stuff. So you kind of can contain that process to its own container. So Docker is a layer on top of that container technology. Um, oh wait, so the cool thing about containers is uh, there's no virtualization overhead. It's running natively in your operating system. So Docker allows you to define containers, and so I created a container using a container, using a Docker file of this Wacko Pico application all installed. I created it, I pushed it to, so when I, what you're pulling from is Docker Hub. So if you go to Docker Hub, it's similar to GitHub, where people can post, you can post your own Docker images like Adam Dupay slash Wacko Pico. So that's just a Docker, a Docker Hub page. And so you're all pulling down this image. And so when we run it, we'll all run exactly the same things. So if it sounds weird that I'm telling you you're running a Linux process natively, but it also works on Windows and Mac, it's because they all use uh, virtualization under the hood. So you're actually virtualizing a VMware image on all of these to run these Docker containers. So we can then run this uh, like so. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask Docker to run our container. And the container that we want to run is at the end. The dash D says we want this to run in daemon mode, which means it's going to run in the background because we're going to have a, a web server running. The dash P does port forwarding. So it says forward from localhost 8080 to the Docker image port 80. Right, port 80 is HTTP, that is where our web server is going to run. And then this is we're telling it exactly which container we want to run. So if you hit enter, oh, it failed for me. Oh, that's because I'm already running one. I can kill it. So if you run it, now, it'll take a little while because the what's happening is the Docker image is starting up. It's installing, it's setting up the database for Wacko Pico, and it's starting both the MySQL server and the Apache server. Uh, is anybody's... Yeah. Oh, this may be a problem. Okay, I would choose a different port. Yeah, because burp is on that port. The good thing is you can put whatever you want here. Four nines. That's so weird. You're a madman. Hmm? You're a madman. So, but just the port where it's going to be doing the download, but once yeah. it downloads. No, 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 no. This is a port. So port 80 inside the Docker container is running Apache. So Apache in the container is listening on port 80. What we're doing is saying on our local machine, so on this Mac, port 9999 will forward to the Docker container port 80. So this means once I run this, assuming everything went well, I should be able to go local host colon 9999, and I should see this. Actually, funny story about that. I was uh, at a taxi or Uber driver who was taking me home, and that's like the code to my set the, the code, whatever, it's like, I don't know, star four nines. Mm -hmm. And so I tell her that, it's like star four nines. And so she's just star four nine. <laughs> and I was like, oh, sorry. <laughs> Failure to communicate. I thought that would be easier to explain, but 
apparently a star. So how do we kill the Adina? Wait, so... Dr. D, Dr. Ekel, I think. No idea. I would just ignore it. Well, it doesn't run. Are you sure? Wait, you can buy the rights to high quality version of someone else's picture? So you are running <laughs> two of them. One's listening on port 8080, one's listening on port 980. Oh, so it was running. Looks like that was a Docker error, not necessarily. How do we get a Docker? So you do Docker PS. Yes, how do I kill it? And you gotta run it as soon as how do you kill a Docker? So this will show you all the Docker containers that are running. And then you can kill it by name. So you do Docker kill a dog. Oh, that's a dog. I think you think that. Yeah. And then 5CF. Yeah, you only need enough of this name so that it's not ambiguous. Okay, cool. And what other. What port do we need to start? I would do 999. 80 needs to be the same. Oh. But yeah, now if you refresh, it may work, it may not work. Yeah, it's gotta. Yeah, I'd refresh it while it's starting everything up. But, okay. Wait, why is it www. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that would be no, I, it just started like that. Oh, that's weird. That would just have to just open this. Alright, so if it's working, explore the website. Figure out what it does. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what that is. It's not a doctor. It's not a. 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 It's There's a lot of undefined variables in here by the current user. My time is wrong. Whoever had the time error that I did, your time for your system is probably off. What time is it? Yeah. Don't do life, dude. Time on Windows is never correct. <laughs> it is never correct. How did you get Docker? Uh, had to, uh, works. I had to uh, it? add the no, repository. No, I just got oh. VirtualBox to work. Oh, That's what I'm happy about. Sure. So they have this page over there. I was going to be so sad. Uh, there was so many files on there. Get Docker for Debian. Um, okay. So follow this oh. uh, thing. Uh -huh. and, um, no, like, please. Like, copy and paste this. Work. Then uh, run this command. Okay. Then when you get to this part, uh -huh. You're gonna have to add it um, uh, manually oh, to uh, to yeah. this file. Then after that, you just run this, and then this, and that's it. What is it called again? Uh, so just search for get Docker for Debian. It should come up on Google.
So the time thing was because I had my time wrong. Because building. Mm. Interesting. So, well, when you're doing that, the that's the way we're IP again. There's a load virtual box. Yes. So, not the. So, actually, what you're downloading is bunch of layers, so it's a bunch of Can I plug in my computer or yeah, are you like low? Uh, you should plug it in. Um, part well. of when you have a Docker file, you have to this one. This one. Awesome. Good ass, yes. On top of each other, and so they'll all have a different hash. Oh, that's where we're about to. Just like when we get commits, we'll have a sneaky hash. So it's kind of like that. So I actually built this off of somebody else's Docker file that they already had Linux and Apache installed. Why is it and not so I was able to use what they did and change some things to install it. It's just so one thing after another, another, isn't it? I don't remember. You guys gotta look up. It's like a Docker thing. It's not open Docker. It's some specific file, and then it uses each of these files Docker files images runs to back up. I think it depends exactly on what file system you use, but the AUFS one of the file systems will do like copy on write, so you can have every Docker image essentially has its own file system. But it only changes what that that image changes, so then it gets its own like copy of that file or whatever. So this way, everything that happens in this container is completely different, unique, everything. Um, yes. So you should refresh that to go away. My virtual box to work, and so now I get to install Docker. Oh, I'm you. moving up in the world. Uh, it's working, but I keep trying to this will work. trying to look into an issue there for the install script for some reason. I've been at it's saying it's missing some type of files. Weird. Does Mint accept the binder? Oh, uh, you're using Mint. So yeah, that's I think that's the issue. Sure. What are you doing? What's wrong with Mint? It's like a derivative of Ubuntu. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Thank you. If you go to the GitHub page, uh, under download, like, this is oh, a file right. that has the uh, RPM or the file, file, which then does all the does all the uh, yeah PPA repo stuff. For okay. How's it I think that's one? actually it's saying something. Apparently. Did it actually work this time? Looks like it's good. Alright, I'll don't take it. I don't know what I did to make it work, <laughs> but hey, it's working, it's working. Have you looked at Adam's page? Starting up late. That's a really good YouTube camera. Okay, sure. that's what I thought. I may have to change the oh, permissions. Thank you. Uh, I can test 
that on my Yeah, I thought that uploads would not work, so I'm trying to do uh, oh, uh, what's it called down the fire. Yeah. What are do you know what my commands are? Mm -hmm. It's up there. I do. Yeah, it's it's docker it's run dash d mm. dash p yes, sir, d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d d no, no, you can even do docker run. You can just do docker run, dash d, dash p. Uh, I would do, yeah, four nines colon 80, uh, space Adam Dupay slash wacko pico. Uh, CKO. Wait, wait, wait. There, there we go. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's for Weezy. Oh. For uh, another version of the Can I move on to the other one? Should I be able to connect to the local host colon 9999? Yes. It may take a little while. It's, it's telling me it can't be breached. Wait, where? Do oh, where is it? Space? Where's the output? The, uh, of what? Of the run. Testing? Oh, of the run? Uh, uh, Docker PS. Testing. Do. Docker logs and then the first four digits or the first couple digits of that container. Nine. Yeah, six. Yeah. That's right. Yep. It is running. Try it again. Uh, look up Windows. Has anybody got it to work in Windows? Look up look up Windows Docker port forwarding. It is a good one, right? You want to I sure why. <laughs> Docker run. How do you run it? Oh. Is that what autistic means? You're not paying attention to crap? Yeah. What was that? What? Dash D dash. Uh, <laughs> manual. Just give me a second. Because it, uh, it used to be like this on Mac. No, don't do that. It, so it actually works. It's bad. Oh, really? Yeah. It's not Jesse. Oh, no. Yeah. That's the one that we put in yours. No, we didn't. Yes, we did. No, we didn't. Oh, stretch. We did stretch. Stretch, yeah, stretch. Stretch. Not testing, stretch. What's stretch? Is it stretch, is it stretch after Jesse or is it older? Yes, stretch is version 9. The side is a little. We can try something. Let's try that. Ah, uh, got it. This, uh, I had to go to the IP address of the virtual yeah. machine. Yeah. Oh. Oh my god. Dude, I'm 
Did you get it? No, port 80. Why? It ma I think 999 po maps take localhost 9999 and map it to port 80 for that. Um, well, but what if I want to map it to another port? You can't. Uh, so back up, uh, all the Docker images 80 needs are to be there. Hmm? What? 80 needs to be there. Yeah, see, told you. Because, because the web server is listening on port 80. Right? It's, so it's translating. Like container, no, no, no. There's an Apache no, server no. running <laughs> listening for port 80. See. But if it's just there in the container, because it's only listening inside its Docker container, it's never going to get any of the outgoing connections. But what if I make it listen on another port? You can. You have to change the Apache configuration. Oh. Oh, you're you saying the like Apache is doing yes, that. Yes. Yeah. So inside yeah, so this so Docker image. Oh, this is your back button? Yeah. yeah. Go. Uh, hit sudo. There you go. You know you're now alive. And now the closed. Oh, so the 999 is what port? This is running. Cool. But the uh, what external port nice. is it going to oh, map yeah. to the yeah. internal yeah. Docker yeah. port? Yeah. Oh, okay. The winner is not happy. Hey. Yo, Ali is already downloading all the files on my computer. She already broke the system. How? Yeah. <laughs> no. And then I was following the instructions for a different way. It's not all the time. So. Uh-huh. 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 Uh
Why? One equals one. Well, where the condition became true. What do you mean one equals one? It's always true. Is it? Mm -hmm. Are you sure? No, yeah, this one's not. Not this one. No. I don't know if it's intentional, but it's not formatted right to do that. Oh, well, the word clock is going to be true. So what is this server going to do? Compare ID to the string yeah. negative one or one equal one. Yes. That's comparing. Right now you're doing comparing. All about parsing. This is 340 again, right? So what's it going to say? It's going to say select. So that's the action. Select star from users where ID is equal to the string negative one or one equals one. Right. So are there any users with that ID? No. Probably not. Probably. Right because of how it parses it. So this is part of the trick when you're doing this, is you're on the outside, you don't actually know what queries it's issuing when you test this. Now the question is, so what do I want to do to try to get out of this string? What do I need? Another single quote somewhere? A single quote, yeah. If I have a single quote, then this single quote will maybe match that other single quote. So now I can do something like ID is equal to negative one tick, or a single quote, or one equals one, now, when the web application parses it, what's going to happen? So what's going to happen when this query executes? Show the entire table. Now it gives you everything from users. It selects all the users. Oh, mm, there needs to be another single one. So what is, the, what is the web server do when it gets these bytes? For the, the SQL server. I think it will give error because of the last quote. Yeah. Yeah, it's got to parse it, right? That's the other thing. It's got to parse this string, take this sequence of bytes, and make sense of it as a SQL query. And exactly. So it says, okay, select star from users where ID is equal to uh, negative one or one equals one. And then there's an unmatched single quote here, which is a c uh, syntax error. So it's going to say error. This, this is not valid. Well, why'd you put it there then? to make you realize you have to really understand what's going on when you give these inputs and to look exactly at this string, not what you think is going to happen, right? But how is the SQL server going to actually parse it, right? It's very easy for us to jump when we start seeing these or one equals ones or these kinds of things. But without, without understanding or thinking about, okay, what does the query look like, right? Um, that's the part that we really have to understand. And this is what happens frequently when you test these things. So now we can do something like negative one tick or one equals one semicolon hash mark. And what's the hash symbol in a SQL query? Comment. Comment, Comment there to the end of the line. So it's just like slash slash in uh, C or C++ or most programming languages. So now when it parses it, it's going to say, hey, this is the query, select star from users where ID is equal to negative one or one equals one semicolon. And it ignores the rest of this part, right? Why do we have to have this comment here? Because we need that other tick, right? Why? Because uh, we don't know what comes after it. Yes, so there's two things. A, remember, every single time, no matter what we send, this static string will be concatenated with our input, which will be concatenated with this static string, right? That means that no matter what we input, we'll always have the stuff that comes before us and always the stuff that comes after us. So we need to deal with it somehow, right? Another way we could deal with it is maybe say, uh, or one equals one, or five equals tick five. And then it will do the other tick and then a semicolon and we're fine. Right? But oftentimes, we may not know exactly what it's sending, so it's easier just to comment that out. So we can do other cool things, like uh, <laughs> negative one tick semicolon drop table users. So again, the SQL server takes this. If it has the configuration set where it allows multiple queries in one uh, command, it will parse this, see two separate queries to select from the users table where ID is equal to negative one and also to drop the whole users table, right? So this shows you that with the SQL injection, you can actually delete data completely. Uh, we could also do things like insert into tables. So we can try to insert into the admin table this username and password and these values, Adam D and Pwned. And again, same thing will happen. 
the way, so this is very high level overview. We can actually spend quite some time going into depth in this, which I think we should and will. Um, for now, there's two ways to think about detecting these, right? So the way to think about this is passive approaches where you look for success. So for instance, if you have an, a field that's, let's say, ID equals three, and it gives you article, so it's a blog, it gives you blog number three, right? If you put in one plus two, what should it give you back? Three. If it's I safe, guess. if it's safe, what should it give you back? One plus one. Yeah, it should be, it should look for an, I, an blog article with an ID of one plus two, which should be nothing, so it should give you a 404 or not found or something. If it gives you the blog that has ID three, what does that probably mean? that it actually first solved the, the, the addition and the Yeah, so that's actually part of SQL. So SQL allows you to do this arithmetic operations inside of it. So that means that this value is not properly sanitized. Mm -hmm. And so SQL is adding those two numbers together and giving you the ID with three. Um, you can also do something like this. We saw subqueries. So we can say subquery select two. So this would substitute two in there, and if we got the uh, table of two, that would show that. The other way to do it is an active approach where you try to look for errors. So put in something like O'Malley, right? So this has a tick in it. So if there, if it was single quoted, it'll cause it to be an extra single quote, so you should get an error message or some 500 message. Um, with, and Or you can do things like less than 10, all kinds of stuff. So. The, and the other key thing to think about is when you think about pen testing these applications, where is it possible? So in Waco Pico, where could it be possible? So what's the criteria? But why a form field? Is it every form field? Uh, why what? Uh, yes, I'm feeding to the Everything, I mean, yes, everything that we submit to the server could be a potential vulnerability, but narrowing that down. Like, like a database, so like a search field or something? Oh, yes, right. anything that touches the database, right? So all input could touch the database, right? But you can know that for certain, right? If you're using search, it's got to be searching through the database in some way, right? That would be a good thing to look for. What else? Yeah, the usernames and passwords. Yeah, login, what else? There's a coupon. Coupons, registration, user registration, creating new users, right? All this has to go into the database. Some dynamic content? Uh, it's maybe. It all depends on you have to think through using it. Where did they did they put this data in the database somewhere? If it did, you should try to fuzz it in this way or to test it. Cool. All right. Do it. Oh, I was supposed to do that. I found a stored cross-site scripting thing, but do it. I did. Okay. It's if you go to uh, guestbook, got the cookie. That's cross-site um, scripting. Yeah, that's what I said. Oh, oh, sorry, I thought you meant SQL. No, you covered that. You have to but your uh, download the toolbox or Docker Docker. Docker toolbox. So your toolbox. Figure that. Let me show what you're doing. Show me what you're doing. Well, well, so everything's installed right now. I was actually going to. I knew that I had the Windows. So using the repeater in Burp, as we saw last week, is super handy to do this because you can look through the requests that you made. Wait, why is it like that? And you can try to find those requests. Like mine shows up as the. Oh, I did. I used repeater. That's why I didn't see it. That is super unfortunate. Like. You don't have to use your it just makes things easier. What? Uh, see, I actually uh, see it in the, uh, in the right here. Yeah. Yeah. No. Probably not. Oh. Uh, can you? Yeah, see, like, I was seeing this, and I didn't look like, oh, that's the HTML. <laughs> Maybe. So how do we exploit this? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you eventually craft for Windows. Okay, so. Oh, I got it. So you right. can do this. It just takes forever. So eventually, all I do is just like, okay. So I need to figure out how to contact. So let's just start off with or, right? 
What do you need to confirm? Because the timeline just updates. So is the password vulnerable or the username failed? Uh, username. You know why? Because look. Don't know why. Now you should be able to go to your browser. Don't import any. Don't do it. Morning. Oh, except that you're on Windows. Uh, Will, what do you have to do to do that? So to do what? On Windows. For Docker? Yeah. Uh, oh, you type in, I think, Docker space IP config, or maybe IF config. It'll give you the Here, IP address, it. and uh, then okay. you go Here. to that and set a local host. I think. Oh, yeah. So, Is after it, spinning it, lots of crap into the username, uh, you oh no, to get I, this. I it's yeah. actually so you know you can't exploit this because look, it's been contacting a salt and um, your password. So you know this, is in, this one you cannot hack. So yeah. you have to use, IP, just leave it with something else. Space default. Eventually, you need to crash something into here so, so that way you can, when you click this, it'll log you in as the first user. So if you want to try it. Oh, sorry. It's one word I did. Dash. Yeah. See, oh, so you know how this is a like, That's what I don't like. Like, you can most people like this or one equal one so this will show you and comment, right? So the we're all just the flat. Here you go. Isn't your local machine, uh, the and I think right. that's it. So, so, so watch the. So, so you get that error too. The SQL syntax slash. So, probably go up. What was the output there? The Y. Uh, why do we start with uh, the tick? Like, why do so we have to start with the tick? Like, to like yeah. close so whatever was uh, yes, open? Yes, because you yeah. can change, like, Oh, uh, and then you do an or one. You have a close right here. You need to close that tick. Something like this. And then, once, that th once the username is now closed, you put the or some kind of true method here and then come out the rest of it. Right. And now it's gonna, uh, it shows me what my query is right here. So if I go to action, uh, so I want to continue the home run um, tomorrow. Uh, I can see. change. Yes. What, yeah. what, what is you're sending? What I'm sending? Yeah. Yeah. Keep, like, uh, yeah. I can go. I've got class at 1250, uh, so. Keep showing me. What Where? Right there? So if I change, like, X is equal yeah. or something. I'll be up BOI. I can go. Yeah. I can try and figure out what's happening. <laughs> I have no idea. Although, there is so this. Yeah, that I have <laughs> to figure out why so I can't you go to here, send IP packets. And then <laughs> it's it's just just admin, admin. I got the Opera Poly board. I'll show you the code. Oh, you get it. But I have no idea. Yo, dude, like, I, I oh, tried to create like users, but it just gives right, me the fatal error. Oh, you can get it. You have to close the close the do the do the most do an or one equals one or and then uh yeah so then just uh, 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 work. you can do that but uh, just do that. I just hope that when I upgrade it doesn't yeah, anything in the past running partition so there are ah yeah I think there's like twelve intentional vulnerabilities in lack of eco. Yeah. Yes. There's only one. Somebody found one unintentional vulnerability like six years after I released it. <laughs> six years. <laughs> it was funny. Uh, Wasn't that a really strange one? Uh, it was a really good one, yeah. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was. I never went and fixed it because why would you I? Fix it? Oh, it's, Boy, it's meant to be vulnerable. Uh, no. It came in right when I started this job, so I was going crazy. I was like, oh, that's cool, and then I ignored it. Yeah. Oh, this is kind of the web apps you made for when you were doing all the black box yeah. anime testing. I like how the code you were like, exactly you thought you were really done. You're like 20 lines, I'm gonna make this work. Oh crap, what no, the fuck? No, I didn't think I was done. I, I thought I, I had something. It was close. Yeah. Like oh, really? I mean, like, on the right track. A couple yeah. quarters. I started my like fourth year. So I was on the 4 plus 1 program. I started the last semester my fourth year, and I completed most of the site. And then it took me, yeah, and then the summer I didn't do anything, so I was interning at Microsoft. Then when I came back, I was TAing and taking two broad classes, and I didn't have time to work on it either. And so then Juhani hired me as an RA for the next two quarters. So I take total about like an academic year to do everything, like to run all the things and do all that. Yeah, it was tricky because we, well, maybe I'll have to 
Ask me other questions after we're going to report. Okay. Oh, we're all over there? Yes. Yeah. Such scary. Oh, the, is that center point? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I definitely left it there. Yeah. Oh, well. Only 15 trade bucks for this picture? Yeah. What a steal. How many uh, vulnerabilities? What a steal. Uh, Total? I can't remember. 12 or something? In the readme on the GitHub. I think it says. Let me see. 